Father, I place into your hands the things I cannot do. Father, I place into your hands the times that I've been through. Father, I place into your hands the way that I should go. For I know I always can trust you. Father, I place into your hands my friends and family. Father, I place into your hands the things that trouble me. Father, I place into your hands the person I must be. For I know I always can trust you. Father, we love to seek your face. We love to hear your voice. Father, we love to sing your praise and in your name rejoice. Father, we love to walk with you and in your presence rest. For we know we always can trust you. Father, I want to be with you and do the things you do. Father, I want to speak the words that you are speaking to. Father, I want to love the ones that you will draw to me. For I know I always can trust you. Father, I place into your hands the things I cannot do. Father, I place into your hands the times that I've been through. Father, I place into your hands the way that I should go. For I know I always can trust you. For I know I always can trust you. All right. So our God is a dependable God. No? He is trustworthy. You can put your trust in Him. Not only your trust, you can put your family into His hands. You can put the things that you, you can handle and the things you can't handle also into His hands. And the God is faithful. Our Lord is faithful to take care of it. Let's sing one more song. Uh, 286. Wait a second. How deep the Father's love for us Have washed beyond all measure That He should give His only Son To make a wretch's treasure How great the pain of searing loss the Father turns His face away As wounds which mar the Chosen One Bring many sons to glory Behold the man upon a cross My sins upon His shoulders Ashamed, I hear my mocking voice Call out among the scoffers It was my sin that held him there Until it was accomplished His dying breath has brought me life I know that it is finished I will not boast in anything No gifts, no power, no wisdom But I will boast in Jesus Christ His death 
and resurrection. Why should I gain from His reward? I cannot give an answer, but this I know with all my heart. His wounds have paid my ransom, but this I know with all my heart. His wounds have paid my ransom. All right, let's pray. Let's look back at this week, last month, six months from this year's beginning. God has been so faithful to us. Our loving Father has kept us. His love for us has been so deep. Let's thank Him for His goodness, His faithfulness, for the provision that we received from Him, for the love that we received from other people, the grace that He has shown towards us. Father, we don't deserve any of this, but yet we look back with thankfulness and we say, what a great God we serve. What a loving Father we serve. God who has been compassionate, merciful, patient, forgiving, enduring all things. We are proud to know you as our Father, O oh Lord Father. Helping us, O oh Lord, in our times of iniquity, in our times of trouble, struggles. Father, you have been on our side. Scripture says that you are an ever-present help in our times of trouble. And we have seen your hand at work. Even when we have been giving up all hope, you have been working behind the scenes to make sure that we are loved and cared for. And Father, this evening as we come to your presence, help us to have this attitude of gratitude towards who you are and what all you have done for us. Things that we have not been thankful for, things that we have not remembered to thank you. Help us, O oh Lord, to acknowledge and to be thankful this evening. Especially, O oh Lord, for teaching us the Word of God. Many times we have struggled with understanding the Scriptures and applying it in our lives. But Father, you have been gracious and merciful by giving us the Holy Spirit to explain these passages to us. We have struggled with many passages, but you have made it easier for us to understand and apply it in our lives. Help us, O Lord, to depend on the Holy Spirit even today. As we study the scriptures, open our inner eyes that we may be truly able to grasp the words of wisdom, the words of counsel that you want to speak to us. And help us to align our lives in line with that. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. All right, so welcome once again to the thirst, uh, to the Saturday evening Tammy. We call it the St. John's Bible Study Club. Okay. Why do we call ourselves the St. John's Tammy Club? That's a, that's a story behind that. And Ajit will explain it to us at the end of the session, why we call ourselves the St. John's Tammy Club. Okay. And uh, this evening we are going to focus on something that we've all been doing. We know it. And from our childhood, you know, I still remember learning this uh, prayer, uh, uh, you know, on my knees because uh, I wouldn't learn it otherwise. So my uh, grandmother, she punished me by making me stand on my knees and making me say this prayer, you know, 10 times without mistakes. And then we had to say it in every prayer, you know, whenever, whenever we have family prayer, whenever we have children's prayer, whenever, you know, we, we gather together for prayer, every time we say this prayer. So... It's been a very important part of our lives. And uh, I met some Pentecostal brothers and sisters who say that you don't have to recite the Lord's Prayer. And I agree with them also. And this prayer is not a recitation prayer, but still the prayer is there in the Word of God. So we can always recite the Word of God. So there is nothing, no harm in saying this prayer again. But this prayer has to be our pattern, right? This prayer is supposed to be a pattern for us. So let's look at this prayer, one of the most famous prayers of the Bible, Luke chapter 11. Right? Luke chapter 11, and we're going to look at the whole passage from verse 1 to verse 13. Okay? Luke chapter 11, verses 1 
to 13. All right, before I go in, let me just share the PPT with you so that you'll be able to follow me. All right, where are you? Come on, PPT. Okay. All right. Luke chapter 11, verses 1 to 13. Now, Jesus was praying in a certain place. And when he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, as John taught his disciples. And he said to them, When you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread. And forgive us our sins. For we ourselves forgive everyone who is indebted to us. And lead us not into temptation. And he said to them, Which of you who has a friend will go to him at midnight and say to him, Friend, lend me three loaves, for a friend of mine has arrived on a journey, and I have nothing to set before him. And he will answer from within, Do not bother me. The door is now shut, and my children are with me in bed. I cannot get up and give you anything. I tell you, though he will not get up and give him anything because he is his friend, yet because of his impudence, he will rise and give him whatever he needs. And I tell you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receives. And the one who seeks, finds. And to the one who knocks, it will be opened. What father among you, if his son asks for a fish, will instead of a fish give him a serpent? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? Alright, so let's go into this passage a little more deeper. And uh, I would advise you to you know, keep your Bibles open, follow me verse by verse. And at the same time, keep your diary open, you know, a notepad or a diary, so that you can write down everything that God speaks to you, the important things that you don't want to forget. So when you look back at this passage, you'll be able to learn whatever you, you studied today. Okay? And apply it in your life. So keep your notepad regular and your Bibles by your side. All right, let's go into the first verse. Now Jesus was praying in a certain place, and when he finished, okay. So the disciples were standing there and they were observing Jesus praying. Right? He, they were waiting for him to finish prayer so that they could ask him about teaching them to pray. Now the first thing that comes to their mind was some of them had been John's disciples you no know? gospel of John chapter 1 we find that there were a few disciples who were John's followers who actually started following Jesus when John pointed to Jesus as the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world you know? John chapter 1 okay that was John the Baptist okay John the Baptist so they were all followers of John the Baptist before this became followers, disciples of Jesus, right? Uh, uh, says here, um, verse 35, John chapter 1, verse 35. The next day again, John was standing with two of his disciples and he looked at Jesus and he walked by and said, Behold the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him say this and they followed Jesus. Okay. Now who are these two disciples? Jesus turned and saw them following and said to them, What are you seeking? And they said to him, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you say, staying? He said to them, Come and you will see. So they came and saw where he was staying and they stayed with him that day for it was about the 10th hour. One of the two who heard John speak and followed Jesus was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. Okay, So one person was definitely Simon. Scholars say the other one would have been John. Okay, John, the beloved Baptist, you know, disciple of Jesus. So we don't know for sure who the second person is. But the first person is surely this man, Andrew. So according to Andrew's knowledge, his former guru, okay, John the Baptist, had taught his disciples to pray. So he would have told them, the other disciples, about this, about his adventures with John the Baptist. So they, they also came to him with the reference point was John the Baptist. You know? Now when somebody tells us about John the Baptist, what comes to our mind? One of the greatest prophets, right? He was the one who came before Jesus to prepare the way for him. So he was a prophet. The, one of the huge prophets who are mentioned in the New Testament, but no, 
and he's part of the old covenant you know the, the old uh, uh, way of you know prophet speaking that's the last person among that line of prophets was john and then comes jesus you no know? so john was a prophet he's remembered as a prophet and he's also he gave his life for jesus you know for the one whom he believed he was willing to give his life for speaking the truth for pointing sin into the lives of uh, the king herod so he is also known as a martyr so we remember john the baptist as a prophet as well as a martyr but jesus disciples remembered him as a man of prayer see when you look at the life of john the baptist he was a miracle baby right he was promised to an old couple zachariah and elizabeth so in their old age they had this promised child and the and great things were spoken about john even before his birth he was a miracle baby even though he was a miracle baby he still had to pray according to the scripture he was filled with the holy spirit even before birth and when elizabeth you know heard the voice of mary calling her uh, the the baby in her womb john the baptist was a small, was a unborn baby in the mother's womb he jumped because he was prompted by the holy spirit so elizabeth recognized that and elizabeth looked back and said you are blessed because you bear the master see so he was filled with the holy spirit even before birth and still he had to pray he was one of the most privileged prophets ever because he was introducing jesus to israel even then he had to pray you see according to jesus in um, i think it is uh, luke chapter 7 luke chapter 7 and verse 28 i tell you among those born of women none is greater than john see so john was the greatest prophet who ever lived according to jesus yet john had to pray having so many advantages if he still had to depend on prayer how much more important it is that you and i we pray but we consider prayer as one of the most least important disciplines of our lives right but jesus and john did not consider us like that let's look at jesus life jesus was a man of prayer you know the bible says in luke chapter 3 and verse 21 that he was praying when he was being baptized you know just after baptism he was praying uh luke chapter 3 was 20 now when all the people were baptized and when jesus also had been baptized and was praying the heavens were opened and the holy spirit descended on him see so when he was baptized he was he prayed there and john chapter uh, luke chapter 6 and verse 12 In these days he went out to the mountain to pray and all night he continued in prayer to God and when day came he called his disciples and chose from them 12 so before the choosing of the 12 he prayed why because it was one of the most crucial decisions that he was going to take the men who were going to be the foundations of the of the church so Jesus had to pray there man he prayed much there before he chose the 12 right when the crowds increased chapter 5 verse 16 no but he would withdraw to desolate places and pray jesus was not excited when the crowds increased he knew there was much prayer needed now because his popularity was increasing we on the other hand when the crowds increase we pray less why because we complain to jesus we have less time no we look after the crowd you see i am a very busy person i don't have time to pray but jesus found more time to pray when the crowd increased before he asked the 12 what is your opinion about me luke chapter 9 verse 18 what do who do people say that i am and then peter confessed they say that you are a prophet they say that you are uh, elijah you know john the baptist that's what the crowd say you are but then the crucial question is who do you say that i am and peter answered the christ of god just before this incident verse 18 now it happened that as he was praying alone the disciples were with him see 
so this was a serious confession of faith that peter was going to make on that is going to be uh, you know a lot of declarations were going to come because of that jesus knew when to entrust the church to them and that transition would depend upon this confession so he was praying so, and then it is transfiguration we saw that when he was up on the mountain the disciples fell asleep but jesus continued to pray verse 28 and now about 8 days after these sayings he took them with him peter james and john and went up on the mountain to pray see so while they were praying only the transfiguration happened you see so he was a man of prayer mark chapter 1 verse 35 says early morning when the disciples were searching for him he has gone to a desolate place and he was praying he was praying in the wilderness mark chapter 1 and verse 35 rising very early in the morning while it was still dark he departed and went out to a desolate place and there he prayed the other guys were searching for him and they found him there see simon and his friends they sought after him they seeked after him and they found him so he was a man of prayer no wonder you know disciples wanted to learn how to pray from him they did not ask him you know teach us how to preach they did not ask him teach us how to do signs and wonders but they came and told him teach us how to pray so it's very important that we learn how to pray how to pray correctly how to pray meaningfully how to pray purposefully right so these are the observations that the disciples made john was a man of prayer and jesus also was a man of prayer and they really felt like their prayer life needed a change so they came to jesus and asked him lord teach us how to pray so let's go in to the prayer now first thing that you understand about this prayer is the disciples they already were you know praying people okay they must have been aware of how prayer happens you know in in the synagogue they would be praying people but when jesus was praying something was different something was unique so that's why they would have asked him to uh teach them how to pray many times you know sometimes i feel my prayer is very much limited you know? earlier i used to pray only for myself and then i understood that that's not what prayer is all about prayer is also inclusive of other people so earlier my prayer used to be you know one minute two minutes and all then i understood that it is not about the time but the more time i spend in prayer the more things i can pray about so my prayer time increased after some time then i understood that my prayer was not having this the content that jesus wanted i was always praying for needs 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 and this pattern of prayer had completely slipped my mind so we learn a little more of that right so let's look at this this prayer as a pattern okay now we call it the lord's prayer not because jesus prayed it but the prayer is called the lord's prayer because jesus taught it okay so now why didn't jesus pray this prayer jesus doesn't have to pray for forgiveness of sins because he doesn't have sins you see so this is not the pattern of prayer uh, that jesus was using he used taught the disciples this so it was only for the disciples it was not jesus's pattern of prayer this is the pattern that he has taught us to pray okay so now i would say there is nothing wrong in praying this prayer as it is right personally and as a congregation we can pray this prayer because it is part of god's word and reciting god's word is a good exercise right but we do it incorrectly when we don't say it from a sincere heart or from a submitted heart our heart should be behind it otherwise it becomes just a recital without meaning no and what does jesus say about recitals without meaning gospel of matthew chapter 6 gospel of matthew chapter 6 verse 5 and when you pray you must not be like the hypocrites for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners that they may be seen by others truly i say to you they have received their reward six 
But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your father who is in secret. And your father who sees in secret will reward you. And verse 7. And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do. For they think that they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them. For your father knows what you need before you ask him. Pray then like this. Okay. So in the gospel of Matthew, he says, no vain repetitions. Right. And not in public alone right so prayer must be first of all in the private place where god alone can see it where others won't be able to see it see so are you a person of prayer during your personal time okay otherwise you have no right to pray, pray in public see so my relationship my prayer time actually starts in my quiet time in my personal time it's not family prayer is not the time when i only pray or corporate prayer or church prayer is not the time when i pray if i am not a praying person in my closet in my room with the door closed nobody watching me but god then i have no right to be a public prayer person so that's one of the secrets of prayer and secondly he says in verse 7 don't don't just you know, Malayalam is a good word for jalpanangal. You know? Don't just simply uh, pour out gibberish. You know? Words, blabbering things without meaning. God is not interested in that. You think you will be heard because of your many words? God says no. Because of your profound words? No. So, as such, prayer is not like this. That's what Jesus wanted to convey. So, if we are saying this Lord's prayer without having a sincere heart, without being submitted to the Lord, then this prayer is of no meaning. See, it is we are saying it just as gibberish. You know? So, without meaning, we can also sing without meaning, right? Because we know these songs familiar from childhood, we can sing all these songs. I, I know one uncle, you know, who actually knows almost a hundred hymns by heart. He doesn't need, we call him the the walking sankey, you know, he doesn't, we don't, he doesn't need the songbook. He'll just start singing. And I, I, I was so amazed. He, he, he was part of our old church. Okay? And uh, he was a drunkard during the night. And uh, on Sunday mornings, you know, we call him the walking sankey. And he can just sing from, from his memory. You know? And you know how hard the uh, you know, words are, you know, in hymns. And he remembers all these hymns by heart. But many people can actually sing without meaning, without singing from their hearts. Because we know the tune and we know the uh, words. We just sing it from our lips. Sometimes we can preach that way, you know, without the heart. Because preaching is our job maybe, or that's what is expected of us. We can preach without meaning a single word. But prayer also can be like that. And Jesus says, that has no meaning. So, don't recite. Okay? Without heart being submitted and sincere, don't recite it. It does have. It, it will not get you any blessing or benefit. It will not get you any answers. So, why waste time? Why waste his time and your time? Stop doing that. You know? That's what the Lord reminds us. So, let's come back to Luke chapter 11. And then he said to them, when you pray, say, Father. So, everything starts with Father. Right? A relationship with the Father. That's where everything starts with. If we are not in a relationship with the Father, this prayer has nothing to do with us. Right? Jesus recognized God as his Father. That's what he was teaching to the disciples also. And as he was having a constant growing relationship with the Father, that is what he taught the disciples also. Okay? So, how can you and I have a relationship with the Father? The only way that we can have a relationship with the Father is through Jesus Christ. I can know my God as my Father only through the finished work of the cross of Jesus Christ. Turn with me to Romans chapter 8. Romans 8 and verses 14 to 17. Romans 8 verses 14 to 17. 
for all who are led by the spirit of god are sons of god for you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry abba father the spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of god and if children then heirs heirs of god and fellow heirs with christ provided we suffer with him in order that we may be also be glorified with him okay so the first entry point into this prayer is knowing god as our father that comes only when we have received jesus christ as our savior only a saved person can address god as his father because it comes through faith in jesus christ you see and who is this father we come as we read the word of god we get to understand who the father is he is a personal father he is a perfect father he is a patient father powerful father providing father pardoning father protecting father powerful father and a permanent father okay that's who he is and this prayer actually defines him see so is this your heavenly father see many a times i was i was confused with my earthly father and when i looked at the heavenly father i thought my heavenly father is like my earthly father which is not true earthly father and heavenly father are worlds apart and because i i did not have a very meaningful productive uh, you know uh, relationship with my earthly father i had a fearful uh, you know uh, like scared kind of relationship with my father earthly father i substituted this relationship to the heavenly father also which is actually wrong he was not at all like my earthly father and then for me to get acquainted to this heavenly father was a new experience and once i got to know this father this heavenly father my relationship with my earthly father changed my anger and bitterness and unforgiveness towards my earthly father changed and i was able to see him as god's instrument in my life see so this is the primary relationship our relationship with the heavenly father is a primary relationship on which all other relationships on this earth is also measured right so knowing the father the heavenly father is very very important in our lives he should be the father of jesus you know the father whom jesus tried to introduce to us he should be the father of the word of god and this is the Uh, this is the detail of this father that we come to right so we come to the father as as we put our faith in jesus christ galatians chapter 4 and verses 1 onwards galatians chapter 4 verses 1 onwards i mean that the heir as long as he is a child is no different from a slave though he is the owner of of everything but he is under guardians and managers until the date set by his father in the same way we also when we were children were enslaved to the elementary principles of the world but when the fullness of time had come god sent forth his son born of woman born under the law to redeem those who were who were under the law that is us so that we might receive adoption as sons and because you are sons god has set, sent the spirit of his son into our hearts saying crying abba father so you are no longer a slave but a son and if a son then an heir through god see what god did see what the father did he sent jesus at the right time he sent jesus and he redeemed those who were under the law so that we could receive adoption as sons and now once we are sons we can call abba father abba is a very personal intimate way of calling father just like how my children call me papa that's how you know abba is so this is the intimacy to which jesus has brought us into through him we can call him father so every saved person can call him father otherwise we don't have a relationship with him this prayer has no meaning to us then the second uh, part of it says hallowed be your name your kingdom come right so first we start with the relationship father son and then it comes to responsibility what is our responsibility to honor god in front of people that is our responsibility to lift up his name in front of people that is our responsibility seeing us honor the father they should also know that our god is 
hallowed. His name must be hallowed. Hallowed means to be respected, to be considered holy. So, how do we do that? Whenever we desire that God's will be done here on earth, that is when we are exalting Him. That is when we are considering His name as hallowed. See? Prayer is not for man's will to be done in heaven. Prayer is for God's will to be done on earth. Many times our prayer is like, you know, this is what I need, Lord, you make it happen. You make the changes, you know, so that I will get my IAS, so that I will get my medicine, you know, degree. I will get my medicine seat. You make the changes. And God says, no, no, that's not my will for you. We have no room for that. We say, no, 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 let man's will be done on, in heaven. And God says, no, my child, you know, it doesn't happen that way. See, So, prayer is not telling God what we want and then selfishly enjoying whatever we get. Prayer is asking God to accomplish what He wants by using each one of us so that His name is glorified. See? His kingdom is extended and His kingdom is strengthened. See? So, my personal request must be in the light of God's will. What is God's plan for me? Accordingly only my, my request should go. You see. So the purpose of prayer is not for my will to be done in heaven. It is for God's will to be done in my life. See. If I am expecting God to hear my prayers and answer me, then my personal request must be in light of God's will. Right? So that is where my responsibility is. My responsibility is, I must hallow his name before the people. And I must allow his kingdom to come to where I am living, to where I am working, to where you know I am worshipping. There his kingdom should advance. There his kingdom should be strengthened. And for that I should be an instrument. You see, the, the, the perspective changes. It's not from me, it's from him. You see? Then, how do we know what is God's will, by the way? We know God's will from this book, the Bible. There is no other way to know God's will but from this book. So, the more we pray, the more we should read the Bible. The more we should study the Bible. If we don't have a clear understanding of what God's will is, then we won't be able to correctly pray. So, it is very important that as a Bible student you must grow, then only our prayers will become more and more biblical, more and more meaningful. See, you can't separate the word of God from prayer. John chapter 15 and verse 7. John chapter 15 and verse 7. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish. That's prayer, you see. I'll say it again. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, Ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. See? We want to think of it like you know Aladdin and the magic lamp. Whenever we come and kneel down and God will answer everything that we pray. It doesn't work that way. How it works? John chapter 15 verse 7. If you abide in my word, yeah, my words abide in you, then you ask. See? So that's the secret of meaningful prayer. Knowing God's will. We don't know God's will outside of this book. See? We, if you are professing Christians, you know, we disobey the word of God. And then we try to defend ourselves. We say, oh God, that's okay. You know, uh, some people say, uh, I married, you know, I'm a believer, but I want to marry this uh, unbeliever. And I justify it and say, Lord, I want to make that person also into Christian. That is why evangelism was my motive when I got married, you see. But they are breaking the word of God, you see. First, uh, Second Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14. Now, these verses we know, but, no, but you know, conveniently we bypass it whenever our, uh, our chance comes, our turn comes to uh, obey the word, right? Second Corinthians chapter 6, verses uh, 14 onwards. Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. For what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness? Or what fellowship has light with darkness? What accord has Christ with Belial? Or what portion does a believer share with an unbeliever? What agreement has the temple of God with idols? For we are temples of the living God. Uh, living God. So, 
is a clear teaching about how i must uh, you know choose my life partner and i want to bypass this when it comes to my marriage i have i heard many people many christians come back and tell me like my life is hell because i married this unbeliever it is clearly you know you are not in god's will see another person you know I, I, he gave me a call uh, and he saying that he is living together with another person thinking about getting married and i you know uh, i am asking him like why are you living together with that person why aren't you not already married and then he says that's okay you know god understands and times have been changing so this person i i'm in love with this person i want to marry her only but she is not come to a decision yet no what is first thessalonians 4 verse 1 says first thessalonians chapter 4 verse 1 finally then brothers we ask and urge you in the lord jesus that as you received from us how you ought to walk and pl- to please god just as you are doing that you do so more and more for you know that what instructions we gave you through the lord jesus for this is the will of god your sanctification that you abstain from sexual immorality that each one of you know how to control his own body in holiness and honor not in the passion of lust like the gentiles who do not know god that no one transgress and wrong his brother in this manner because the lord is an avenger in all these things as we told you before and solemnly warn you for god has not called us to impurity but in holiness therefore whoever disregards this disregards not man but god who gives his holy spirit to us clear teaching from the word of god right living together is not god's will but we do it you know? and we try to defend ourselves we just to justify ourselves and say uh, no when i am wanting to marry this person but only if that person is willing i can marry right so i'm waiting for the right time i'm waiting for that person's heart to change so unless we know the word of god we would not know how to ask correctly we would not know what is god's will and we would not pray correctly so knowing the word of god is very very important now let's go to the next verse then we go on to the requests three requests we have had no request for daily sustenance request for forgiveness and request not to lead us into testing right now god has promised us everything for our needs not for our greed right forgive us what we have done yesterday right and then we continue to material and physical provision then we go into moral and spiritual perfection god has to lead us into more and more perfection and then divine protection we need both protection and direction right so all our requests can be summed up into these four categories forgiveness material and physical provision moral and spiritual perfection divine protection and direction these are the requests that we have for ourselves right beyond this everything is god's grace but these are essentials that we should pray for nobody will pray for these things for us we have to pray for these things for us i must ask god to forgive me for what i have done to other people i must ask for god, forgiveness from god for how i have handled his word and have handled his ministry material and physical provision i need sustenance no i need to pray for that moral and spiritual perfection i need i need to keep growing in my holiness divine protection yes god is the one who protects me god is the one who gives me direction to work so i need that every day in my life so i must keep on praying for that so all our requests can be clubbed into these four headings then verse 5 to 8 actually talks about persistence in prayer no god actually jesus actually talks about a grouchy neighbor okay he says that uh, this fellow you know he doesn't want to help this guy but he keeps on doing it knocking on the door and ringing the bell so as to get rid of the headache you know get rid of the irritation he will get up and give the food now jesus is not saying god the father is like that okay in fact jesus is saying god the father is the opposite of this grouchy neighbor he is a good father okay now the comparison is from lesser to greater this neighbor is the lesser god is the greater god is not tired god is not selfish god is not irritated but how much more the loving father you know that's what jesus wants to compare 
how much more the loving heavenly father so he is giving a correctly opposite example from the earthly perspective and then saying the exact opposite is how the lord is so won't he do it yes from lesser to greater that's how the uh, comparison goes okay so uh this person was a friend of this man and being a friend itself he was irritated because he came at an odd time and because he continued irritating he got all the more grouchy but he went and gave the request now our point is our prayer is not based on friendship our prayer is based on sonship father is not like the neighbor father never sleeps father never gets irritated or impatient he is always generous and he delights in answering his children if that is the condition why not pray why don't we pray and pray all the more you see that's the question jesus can to ask us if god is quick to respond and is eagerly waiting to respond why don't we pray see so if prayer would bring so much of blessing persistence in prayer would bring much more blessing that's the point that jesus wants to make so he's not saying that the father is like the neighbor in fact he says the father is the opposite of the neighbor he's not at all like the impudence that's the word that is used in my esv bible okay impudence actually means shamelessness or boldness or disrespect which means this man is shamelessly asking for his need and that man would show how, you know in israel there is another side also in israel if the uh, owner of the house doesn't open the door and give him what that friend asks the friend goes and tells everybody you know what i consider this fellow as a friend and he didn't give me my needs that actually caused a lot of shame on the man on the friend who didn't open the door you see so to avoid shame a friend will help you and why does our father answer our prayers not only to meet the children's needs our heavenly father answers our needs because this answering will also bring glory to his name see so when he doesn't answer the child his reputation is at stake so god will do it that's what jesus is saying he can be trusted you see now always understand persistence in prayer is not to change the heart of god god's heart doesn't change he already knows what to do and he is already determined on doing that but the the persistence in prayer is because it changes us to receive the answer which god wants to give us see so we must persist in prayer till we are mature enough to handle the answer that god is going to give us see so that's very very important so just because jesus is persistent in prayer look no, just continue to no, know sometimes we have to change our prayer change our prayer so that the prayer can change us example i can give you from the old testament is there's this lady who was praying for a child her name is hana you know uh, she was the wife of a na- man called elkana who had another wife also and elkana and uh, hana used to come to the temple to pray and she would go to the temple and she would go there and bow down and weep say god give me a child give me a child give me a child give me a child one day she changed her prayer she said lord if you give me a child i will give him back to you god is also looking for us for a prophet and when she changed her prayer god answered her prayer did she get a son yes did god get his prophet yes you see so persistence in prayer is sometimes so that our prayers would change us to become the right recipients for god's answer to become matured enough to handle god's answer so pray and pray persistently that's what jesus says now verses 9 to 13 i tell you ask and it will be given to you seek and you will find knock and you know actually the tense is very very important in this passage the tenses are very very important what he says is keep on asking keep on seeking and keep on knocking okay what it means is that don't come to god only in times of emergency at the 11th hour don't come and ring the bell yes god will faithfully will answer but don't make that a habit no? sometimes we talk about arrow prayers sending quick prayers to god when we are outside the icu we send quick prayers to god lord help that person you know when we are almost about to be hit by a truck we say lord save me 
those are all arrow prayers quick prayers short prayers but what about a christian who lives on arrow prayers that's a shame you see we should have unhindered times of prayer other than that also then only the arrow prayers will work see elijah prayed a short prayer when the prophets of baal were challenging him no when he was challenging the prophets of baal he said lord fire from heaven let them know that you are alive but he had done his prayer homework before and this was an arrow prayer god listened but he he already finished his prayer and then came to the confrontation you see so we should also be people who are praying asking seeking and knocking not just in emergency but during the other times as well see that's what jesus is saying in john chapter 15 abiding you see if you are abiding in me so abiding is not you know quick visit and go back no abiding means you stay there keep in constant communion with the father let not amen finish your prayer and this dust it off and go off no. throughout the day you know be consistent in your prayer life pray without ceasing says first thessalonians chapter 5 verse 17 how do you do that whenever you remember pray whenever you pray remember <laughs> that's how you cease with pray without ceasing when you remember that person pray for that person when his picture comes to your mind immediately pray for that person he had asked you for prayers pray for that person when you are praying in your regular time of prayer remember that person and pray these are two ways you can actually have a consistent prayer life a persistent prayer life now either god will answer our prayer or god will show us why he is not able to answer that prayer that's what persistence does why he cannot answer that particular prayer he will definitely show us and that will actually change us the way that we are praying for this person huh? so uh we can have whatever we want in our lives so that the father's name would be glorified so god will not bless you with anything by which his name is not going to be glorified see some people pray that you uh, know lord give me that give me this give me this give me that but it may, does not work why because the ultimate motive of their hearts is not to glorify god and god knows that motive see so we have to check whether our motive is really to glorify god or not then only our prayers would be answered now how does it end it ends by him asking us to pray for the holy spirit okay there is an exhortation to pray and the exhortation comes towards the holy spirit and jesus says this parable about the good father if an earthly father who is a wicked father knows how to bless his child a sinful father knows how to bless his child how much more the heavenly father knows how much more the heavenly father is good again lesser to uh, the higher okay so here he says the earthly father is the lesser father and he says earthly father knows how to give good gifts how much more the heavenly father and in that good thing see includes what the holy spirit the holy spirit see so the the purpose for which our prayer is to be is to have the holy spirit and to have more of the holy spirit see god desires that the best gift be given to us right and the best gift that can be given to you and me is what the holy spirit himself why because god wants us to be effective god wants us to be powerful god wants us to be witnesses the only way you can be all this you know sometimes we think that okay only in ministry we need the holy spirit no in our homes we need the holy spirit more than ever if i have to be faithful to my wife i need the power of the holy spirit if i need to guard my eyes from things the trash that tv is showing me i need the power of the holy spirit to be a witness in front of my children to raise them up in godly fear i need the holy spirit's power i can't do it by myself you're a fool if you think that you can do all these things by yourself the world tries to do it by their own strength we need the strength of the holy spirit to do it and the scripture says that god desires that he would be able to give us more why he is not able to give because we don't pray for him see pray for the holy spirit god loves to give good gifts and god wants to give more of the holy spirit into our lives and how do we do it by asking seeking knocking 
and god wants to fill our hearts with the holy spirit in every area of our life in my family life in my personal life in my spiritual life in my uh, uh, vocation life wherever i am working wherever i am witnessing god wants me to fill my area that life with the holy spirit so that i would be a powerful christian wherever god has placed me you see that's a desire of god's heart what do we desire we desire chocolates we desire ice cream we desire biryani god says no desire greater things and you ask me for greater things i dislike to give you all this see i know you need those those things and i will give you those but that's not the issue here the issue is how much of a witness you want to be how much of a christian do you want to be how much of a jesus follower do you want to be that much more you should be filled with the holy spirit so god desires to give you great gifts god desires to fill your life with the holy spirit how much are we seeking after him how much are, are we knocking how much are we searching after him that's the question so the whole thing is about asking the right things and receiving great things from god jesus asked for the right things he got greater things from god and let's follow that pattern let's change our prayer life let's ask the lord lord teach us really teach us how to pray you know sometimes we have to dismantle the structure that is there so that he can build the new structure so let's dismantle our prayer life and say lord my prayer life is not going anywhere it's not nearly as interesting as how you make it out to be so i want to learn from you afresh teach me how to pray and let the lord teach you really how to pray let's pray heavenly father as we come to you this evening help us to understand as children of god to ask for the right things for the good things for the great things and to receive from our heavenly father the things that he desires for us help us to have the right perspective on prayer the priority of prayer if john the baptist had to pray if jesus the son of god had to pray how much more we need to depend on prayer o lord father help us to understand the role of the word of god in our prayer life and help us not to seek after our own selfish goals and selfish will but to seek after your will to be done in our lives in our world here we commit ourselves into your hands today teach us oh lord from the foundation how to pray correctly in jesus name amen